Hi guys, uh, welcome this morning. Uh, I'm glad you could join me. Uh, let's just open this uh, this message this morning in a quick word of prayer. Uh, Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day and we thank you for this opportunity to be here, Lord. And uh, we thank you for the technology to be able to do this, Lord, as much as Facebook brings problems in people's lives. Um, there is a blessing behind it and God, so we just thank you for this, Lord. And God, I just ask that uh, what I'm speaking today, oh God, I help. I ask that you would help me to speak it clearly, that uh, people would understand. I pray, God, that uh, you would prepare people's hearts and minds, Lord. There's a lot of opinions, and there's a lot of thoughts on about the rapture, Lord. And so, on a topic like this, God, um, I just ask that you would prepare people's hearts and minds for what's going to be taught here today, Lord. Um, God, be with us. Um, strengthen us and encourage us this uh, these these days Lord and we just thank you in your name we pray amen amen <clears throat> well I want to speak a message to you today that I've entitled rapture ready rapture ready if I can have you open your Bibles please to second Thessalonians chapter 2 second Thessalonians chapter 2 and we're going to start in verse 1 and the scriptures read this way now, dear brothers and sisters, let us clear some things, clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we will be gathered to meet him. Don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by those that say the day of the Lord has already begun, and don't believe them even if they claim to have had a spiritual vision, a revelation, or a letter supposedly from us. Don't be fooled by what they say, for the day will not come. Until there is a rebellion against God and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the one who brings destruction. Now I want you to imagine for a moment that you're living in this community and you find out that there is an invading army that has attacked your country. And it is destroying, this army is destroying every town, every village, every city. It is completely laying waste to everything it comes to. You find out that it's the next community over from yours. Now there's a lot of hopelessness. You know that they're, they're going to attack. You know the moment's coming. You know the time is coming. You can hear the bombs going off. You can hear the gunfire. You can hear the, the, uh, the machines moving toward your town. You know it is just a matter of time before you are taken over. Suddenly, out of nowhere, you hear the sound of a helicopter. The helicopter comes in, it swoops in, it takes you to safety and you are saved. Imagine for the mo of a moment the joy you would feel. Imagine the hope that you would feel. Imagine the thankfulness that you would feel for your rescuers in that moment. Imagine that for a moment, right? Well, this is actually exactly how the Bible explains the moment, right? Well, this is actually exactly how the Bible explains the hope, the joy, and the thankfulness that will be present in your life when you begin to understand the doctrine of the rapture of the church. See, for the next few moments, I want to talk to you about this teaching about the rapture. But I'm not interested in telling you my opinions. I'm not interested in trying to give you an interpretation of verses that I may or may not be biased toward in my interpretation. What I want to do today is I want to ask you a few questions, <clears throat> and I'm going to point us to some verses that answer those questions about the rapture, and it explains it in plain English. There is no interpretation required it is as simple as it can get. You do not need any theological understanding to understand what the verses are that I'm going to read to you today. So, my hope is this, that by the end of this message, you are going to have a clear understanding of some of the important questions and the important details we need to ask ourselves about the rapture. So, the first question we must ask ourselves about the rapture is this, what is the rapture? When we talk in the church about the rapture, what is it that we're talking about? In 2 Thessalonians 2, starting in verse 1, it says, Now, dear brothers and sisters, let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we will be gathered together to meet him. So, you won't find the word rapture 
anywhere in the Bible. I don't know if you realize that, but that word rapture you will not find anywhere in the Bible. The reality is the word rapture is a word that we have come up with in the English language to identify this event that is in Scripture that's to come. A very significant event, not only in the life of the church, but in the life of all humanity. And so we've just come up with one word to describe this event. This event is something that every genuine Christian is waiting for. The Bible describes this event as the gathering of Christians or the gathering of the church to meet Jesus when he returns. That is what the Bible describes this event, and that is what we call the rapture. In 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 15, it says this, We tell you this directly from the Lord. So the Apostle Paul is saying, we're telling you this, it's coming straight from God. So what am I, I'm about to tell you is not something I've made up. He said, this is coming from God. We who are still living, when the Lord returns, will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come from heaven with a commanding, commanding shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the Christians who have died and will raise from their graves. Then, together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. The Bible explains extremely clear what the rapture is. Christ was crucified for our sins. So Jesus died on the cross for your sins and mine. Okay? But here's the awesome part. It, 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 it reconciled that relationship with God is awesome. But here's the great thing. Jesus didn't remain in the grave. He rose from the grave on the third day. In fact, many of the writers of the New Testament were eyewitnesses to Jesus or they knew the person and they got their information from an eyewitness of Jesus after his resurrection. And not only that, but the disciples watched as Jesus ascended into heaven. Now, it's interesting, some of those disciples who watched Jesus ascend into heaven actually wrote some of the letters in the New Testament. Uh, Peter and John and Matthew. These guys, they all witnessed Jesus ascend into heaven. And then Jesus told them something very interesting when he ascended. He said, I'm coming back. He said, I'm going to come back for my church. For anyone who has put their faith in me, I am going to return for them. This is what we call the, the rapture of the church. This is the rapture of the church that is described in our text today. So now that we know what the rapture is and what we're talking about as Christians when we talk about the rapture, the next question that everybody wants to know is this. When is the rapture going to take place? That's the age-old question when you start talking about the rapture. In 2 Thessalonians 2, starting at verse 1, it says, Now, dear brothers and sisters, let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we will be gathered to meet him. In other words, let me clarify some things about the rapture. Don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. Don't believe in, even if they claim to have had a spiritual vision, a revelation, or a letter supposedly from us. So in other words, the rapture has not taken place yet, and don't believe anyone who claims to be some spiritual guru. Don't believe anyone who claims to have heard a word from the Lord. Don't believe anyone who says that the rapture has taken place already. Paul says it has not taken place. And then this is what he says. You ready for this? This is plain as day. Don't be fooled by what they say. For the day will not come. The rapture will not take place until there is a great rebellion against God and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the one who brings destruction. So once again, the Bible makes very clear statements about the rapture. This is about as clear as you can get. You do not need a theological understanding to understand what Paul just wrote. The Bible says that the rapture will not take place. It will not until there is a great rebellion 
and until the man of lawlessness is revealed. Now, when the Bible gives prophecy, and that prophecy is fulfilled, the prophecy is fulfilled with complete accuracy. So it's it it has to be. It's either fulfilled with complete accuracy or it's considered a false prophecy or it's considered unfulfilled. And so we still wait for the prophecy to be fulfilled. Now let me explain by what I mean. The Old Testament is filled with prophecies about the coming Messiah, Jesus. And so the whole thing is filled with prophecies all over the place. But the reality is this. If the prophecies were not fulfilled, then we would not have known for certain that Jesus was the Messiah we were waiting for. Let me use this as an example. So the Bible prophesied that the Messiah was going to be born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem, and born in the line of David. Those three things were very important details about the coming of Jesus Christ the first time, the birth of our Savior. So here's the deal. If he was born of a virgin, if he was born in Bethlehem, but he was not born in the line of David, then the prophecy could not have been considered accurate and could not have been considered fulfilled. If Jesus would not have been born of a virgin, but he would have been born in Bethlehem and born in the line of David, then the prophecy could not be considered fulfilled. See, every detail has to be fulfilled. That's what tells us that what God said is true. We wait for the fulfillment of all those details, and when those details are fulfilled, we know that the Bible has spoken prophecy in accuracy. It's important to understand this. It's very important to understand this, because the fact that these details are met is what shows us the accuracy. We know that Jesus is the Messiah because he fulfilled not only those three uh, prophecies, but he fulfilled a couple hundred prophecies in the Old Testament. That's astronomical. But just that's through his birth, his ministry, and his death. But here's the great thing. His return is going to be no different. The details must be met for this prophecy to be fulfilled. And two of those details that are made very clear to us is that there's got to be a great rebellion and the man of lawlessness has got to be revealed. Now, this is where things get interesting. In Mark 13, verse 32, Jesus said this, However, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. So we know that there's going to be a great rebellion. We know that the man of God is, the man of lawlessness rather, not the man of God. The man of lawlessness is going to be revealed. But after that, we have no clue. So let me make this clear. We have absolutely no clue if one day we're going to be sitting watching the news and suddenly the Antichrist is revealed and out comes a trumpet, off we go. We have no idea. Or it could be a couple months or it could be years. We do not know for certain, but what we do know is we do have, we know that those two details, the man of lawlessness and the great rebellion has to take place. After that, no man knows the day or the hour. So let me state this clear. Anyone claiming to know the date of the arrival of God is an absolute false prophet and should be avoided at all costs. See, I wonder how many people have been turned away from a relationship with Jesus because they've heard these false prophets standing up and claiming a date. Do you remember Y2K? They told us the end of the world was there and there were so many false prophets back in the year 99 telling us that when the clock struck 12 and it went to the year 2000, the Lord was returning and we were all going to be carried away in the rapture. It was completely false. How many people heard that and went to churches and were trying to get ready for his return only to find out it was a lie and then left the church? See, the reality is the more false prophets that arise and the more false dates that are given, the more people look at Christianity, not only those false prophets, but Christianity as a whole as foolishness and as a complete lie. That's what it is. It actually puts up tremendous stumbling blocks to the faith in people's lives. I wonder if the time has come for just maybe the church again to not give these false prophets 
any podium to stand on. I wonder if it's time for the church not to give them any more means to spread their lies. See, I think the time has come. I think the time has come. So we know what the rapture is. It, it was stated clearly. Now we know that there's some things that have got to take place, but we also know that we don't know the actual day or the hour. But now we're come to the final question I want to ask today, and it is the most important question of all when it comes to the rapture. How do we prepare ourselves for the rapture? How do we make sure we are prepared? In Acts 2, starting in verse 37, it says, Peter's words pierced their hearts. And they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you and to your children, and even to the Gentiles and all who have been called by, our Lord, by the Lord our God. And then Peter continued preaching for a long time, urging his listeners strongly, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So, on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit's poured out on the people, on the, those in the upper room. Peter comes out and he preaches this message. And the Bible says that those who listened to this message were pierced to the heart, and then they asked the all-important question, what must we do to be saved? So Peter says a couple interesting things. He says, repent. So if you want to be saved, he says, repent. Turn from your sin. That means if you're living a sinful lifestyle, if you're making choices in your life that God says is sinful, you need to turn from those sins. You need to turn away from that lifestyle. And then the Bible says this, and be baptized. In other words, you need to make a public and a private commitment to live your life for Jesus Christ. You need to make that commitment that all the days of your life, you are going to live for the Lord. You need to make that commitment. And in the Bible says this, you need to put your faith, well, that's part of putting your faith in Jesus to be saved. Jesus said this in Matthew 24, starting in verse 12, sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. The one who endures to the end. Jesus said it's going to get rough. When you begin to read through Matthew 24, things are going to get pretty bad, right? Things are going to get pretty bad before he returns. But he said this, only those who endure to the end will be saved. It's your responsibility. It's your responsibility to read scripture. It's your responsibility to pray. It's your responsibility to try and cultivate this relationship with Jesus. It's your responsibility that when things get rough in this life, that you don't get up and walk away from a relationship with Jesus. See, I wonder how many people have started strong. They've been on fire for Jesus only to eventually walk away from their relationship with him because things got tough or because that relationship wasn't as exciting as it was when they first gave their uh, life to him. I wonder how many people have not endured to the end. See, Jesus said, though only those who endure to the end will be saved. But the, what's being left unsaid this is how Jewish teaching was a lot of times. They would, they would make a statement, but the opposite was also true. He said this, only those who endure to the end will be saved. But what that means is this, those who do not endure to the end will not be saved. I need you to ponder that for a moment. That is some pretty heavy teaching from Jesus. Mark 13, 33 says, and since you don't know when that time will come, be on guard. Stay alert. Once again, Jesus is imploring people in this text, stay alert. Be on guard. Keep this relationship important. Endure to the end. You must hold on. In Matthew 24, 42, it says, so you too must keep watch. You don't know the day that the Lord is returning. Again, 
Jesus says again to be alert, stay on guard. He's saying endure to the end. See, I wonder if it's possible that if Jesus felt it was so important to remind us over and over and over again to endure to the end, to remain alert. I wonder if Jesus found it so important if just maybe it's important that we're teaching this today, especially when we're talking about the doctrine of the rapture. See, I wonder if just maybe we have spent so much time on the details of the rapture and we've spent so much time on the timing of the rapture that we have spent very little time on actually teaching people to be ready for the rapture. Man, the simple truth is this. When the trumpet sounds, you are either going to be ready or you are not going to be ready. You are either going to meet Jesus in the air that day, or you are going to be left on this earth to suffer as the earth finds more death and violence and disease and hatred. You've got a choice today. You've got a choice. You can either begin to try and be prepared for the return of Jesus Christ, or you can stand there unalert and uncaring, and when the rapture comes, it'll be too little too late. So my question for you today is this, are you ready? Are you ready for the return of Jesus Christ? This is where we're going to conclude today. Although the Bible makes it clear that we have no idea what the day or the hour is that Jesus Christ is going to return, we do know that for prophecy to be fulfilled, at least these two details have got to be met. One. The man of lawlessness has to be revealed. Two, there has to be a great rebellion. Not in those orders. Actually, it's the opposite. There has to be a great rebellion, and then the man of lawlessness has got to be revealed. But no one knows when Jesus is returning after that. He could come in the moment that the man of lawlessness is revealed, or it could be a period of time afterwards. All we know is that for prophecy to be fulfilled accurately, those two things have to take place. See, Jesus is returning, and we must be ready when he does. So my challenge for you this week is simple. I want you to search your heart. I want you to begin to search your life. I want you to begin to take stock of how you are living your life, and I want you to ask yourself this simple question. If Jesus was to return today, are you ready? Are you ready for the trumpet call. Are you ready for the rapture of the church? If you are not, then I challenge you to repent this week. Turn from that sin in your life. Commit your life to Jesus Christ and be saved. Endure. Endure through the hardships. Endure through the suffering. Endure through the immorality that's all around us. Endure. Endure to the end. That's what we're called to do. If you have already looked and you said, I am ready, I am prepared, I cannot wait for his return, then my challenge for you today is this. Tell someone else. <coughs> Excuse me. My challenge for you is this. Tell somebody else about Jesus. Help somebody else be prepared. That's the mission of the church. That's what we're called to do. See, we are running out of time here on earth. The time is rapidly approaching for the return of Jesus. And those who we don't tell, those who are not prepared when the Lord returns, it'll be too little, too late. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you, God, that you're coming back. Lord, we know you're coming back soon because, God, everything is starting to point to that. Lord, I just ask that you would help us to be prepared for your return. God, I ask if there be anything unclean in me, if there be anything unclean in those who are hearing this today, Lord Jesus, I ask that you would begin to reveal that to us, that we may seek you, we may ask forgiveness, and we may press into you, that our relationship with you would grow. Increase our faith, O oh God. Increase our faith in these last days. God, give us the courage, give us the strength, and give us the endurance, Lord, to tell others about you to tell others about your coming, to tell others to repent, 
to turn from their sin, to turn from their wicked ways. Lord Jesus, time is running out. And God, we need you to strengthen us today to do what you asked us to do here on earth. Lord, we love you. We love you, Jesus. And God, we need you. So Lord, we just ask, oh God, that you would prepare us for your coming. In your name we pray. Amen. So until we meet again, whether it is here or whether it's in the rapture, may God bless you.